19 attorneys general gave uh, illustrations from their own states of situations where this had happened, both to individuals, but also to organizations, nonprofits, religious organizations that were supporting uh, life, supporting other things, and of course, Second Amendment issues as well. So this is happening around us, and the warning that I you know, have been giving to Americans is you have to be aware this is going on, that it's not just uh, those in the spotlight, people like uh, Nigel Farage or General Flynn. One of the things that we were going to talk about was the weaponization of everything, uh, including the banks, uh, to quiet people, to silence people, really to destroy liberty uh, and uh, the way of life that we've had in America where the people are able to govern themselves and express themselves freely. Um, talk a little bit about that, the weaponization of you know, banks. So one of the things that happened immediately after January 6th was the FBI requested banking records from the big, from the big banks that was provided without subpoena, without legitimate basis. Uh, but that was just the beginning. Um, we've seen, uh, really across the world, examples in the past several years that the banking system, the financial system, banks and payment processors, the whole architecture of the financial world have been targeting conservative views, political, conservative political views, conservative religious views, right to, to, to life. And we've seen it all the way from the very elites of society, well-known, uh, famous, well-known people, such as uh, former National Security Advisor, uh, General Michael Flynn, who I know you know and you've talked to him about this, whose family was targeted around these issues. Uh, recently, Nigel Farage, who was the founder leader of the Brexit party and a permanent thorn in the side of the British political establishment, was targeted by his bank, Coots, in the UK. They sent him a letter saying, we're sorry, we can no longer provide you with banking services. No explanation required. He stood up and protested. The CEO of the bank lied, reached out to the BBC and said, oh, it's because of commercial reasons. He didn't have enough money in our accounts. The BBC printed that story. Uh, a few weeks later, Nigel Farage gets finds internal documentation within the bank from their compliance department, finding an extensive document that pointed to Brexit, pointed to his affiliation and affinity for President, former President Donald Trump, his views on the Russian-Ukraine war, views on immigration, et cetera, et cetera, as the sum total of the reasons why they wanted to sever the relationship from the bank. As soon as all this came to light, now it did result, it, the, the CEO of Coots was fired, the chairman was fired, the CEO of the parent bank was all fired. But this shows you what is going on at the highest level. Now the parliament is looking into it, but it's not just high profile people. We saw what happened to the Canadian truck drivers and anyone who dared to try to support them uh, last year or a year and a half ago, whenever this was, they were cut off altogether. It's gotten so bad that recently, I believe in May of this year, 19 attorney generals from across the United States sent a letter to J.P. Morgan uh, asserting that they were, in fact, discriminating against conservative political and religious views. 19 attorneys general gave uh, illustrations from their own states of situations where this had happened, both to individuals, but also to organizations, nonprofits, religious organizations that were supporting uh, life, supporting other things, and of course, Second Amendment issues as well. So this is happening around us, and the warning that I you know, have been giving to Americans is you have to be aware this is going on, that it's not just uh, those in the spotlight, people like uh, Nigel Farage or General Flynn, but as we saw with the truckers, it can happen. And by the way, it does happen on a daily basis, anonymously, quietly, that people are getting cut off. You know of people doing this. And, wh and what can we do about this? Well, the first thing is to align. Find uh, banks that, that do align with your values, maybe regional ones, smaller ones that aren't you know, caught up in the global system, that aren't caught up in, in these issues around ESG and other things. Diversify, get, you know, maybe you can, maybe have more than one bank, so you've got uh, some, some options. Learn about non-bank alternatives other places where you can store value. A uh, coffee can in the backyard <laughs> with gold bullion in it. Gold, crypto, uh, other things Well, like no, this. you know, in all seriousness, like a, a lot of people are onto this. Yeah. But if you're not onto this, folks, you need to be onto this. Um, I realized that, uh, you know, we, we need to raise money uh, for a lot of projects we're doing with Metaxas Media. I rarely talk about it on this program. But I realized that the crowdfunding uh, I can't remember the, the name of the crowdfunding, you know, the, the, the one that, that shut down the truckers. Yeah. Uh, 
that they are go fund me. I believe go fund. Yeah, they're in the bed. They're in bed with the devil. They they can steal your money. And so we were thinking of of trying to raise money there. And then I realized I can't do that. I cannot align myself with them because you can't trust them. If they don't like what you're doing, they can take your money. I mean, it really is so evil. So uh, we went with Give, Send, Go. uh, And Give, Send, Go uh, does align with my values. So if you want to give to my projects, go to givesendgo.com slash Eric. Give, Send, Go is one of the good guys, but we need to get the word out about who are the good guys out there. Where can I spend my money? Um, you know, where can I invest my money? Where can I spend my money? Uh, where can I give? Because when you bring this up, it's a chilling thing, Mike, that we're living in a day when, because of technology, uh, you know, you know, the idea that after January 6th, the federal government could be asking for banking records and stuff, that all this stuff, it's just you gotta press some buttons. That's, that's a scary thing to me, that power has been aggregated in the way that it has. We're living in, a, in an age of the panopticon, where government is now. We're already at the point where government is seeing and surveilling everything that we're doing. There was a lot of kerfuffle a week or two ago about this new uh, identity company called WorldCoin, who wants to scan the irises to get uh, information so that people can access the economy. And people are rightly creeped out by this. The issue is that it already exists today. Like our government is already doing this. Think about going through the airport. Think about. uh, We're going, hang on one second. We're talking to Mike Wilkinson. You can find him at stormwall.com. We will continue this conversation. Lots more ahead. Hey there, folks. If you enjoy this video and want to see more interviews like this one, make sure to subscribe to my channel. Please just hit the subscribe button below. Click the notification bell so you don't miss new content every single week. 90% of you who watch are not subscribed, and you could be in the first 100,000 subscribers to my channel. I would love that. Please subscribe. God bless you. There are things we can do about that, right? Like, I will not get clear at the airport because I don't want them to have my biometrics. I don't know if they'll use it. Uh, against me, but there's a good chance they will if they can. And I don't like giving away anything. You know, I won't do 23andMe because I don't want China to have my DNA. The fact is that every time you turn around, people are giving you these like nice alternatives to give away all of this information. So what, what is your advice? Or maybe sketch out the problem first. Well, it's a real dilemma because when I said Panopticon, it, as you said, it t- means that it's already everywhere. I don't believe it's any longer simply a choice about choosing one thing or or the other. As you walk down the street, Eric Metaxas, there are cameras from all angles who are using biometrics, same thing that Clear uses, which happens to use either a fingerprint or an iris. They use facial recognition, broad patterns, mobile passport control, your bank, uh, touch ID on your phone. Okay, is another form of biometric. It's everywhere already. And so the choice becomes, uh, let's go from one extreme to the other, you know, the purest of saying, I'm not going to allow that to happen. Well, you, you have to live in a, in a cave or in a cabin somewhere completely cut off from the grid because otherwise this information is already being collected, being gathered. The technology genie is out of the bottle, so to speak. So we then end up in sort of this intermediate world of trying to make personal choices about whether we want to expand that field of knowledge, provide more uh, data points or input. I'm not suggesting it's easy. That's why I say it's a dilemma, because I I don't think there is an easy way out without complete isolation from the economy, from, from the culture and otherwise. So it's, uh, and, we, and we've crossed that Rubicon. We, 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 we're not going back. And governments won't allow us to go back. Imagine, Eric, just for a second, if by some utopian uh, vision, the US did renounce all of those biometric uh, types of technology. Well, China's still using it. Our adversaries around the world are using it. And they're not only doing collecting it on their own citizens, but through all sorts of means, through travel, through TikTok, through otherwise, they're collecting it on American citizens as well. So the further dilemma is if we were as a government, as a, as a country, to shut that sort of stuff down in the US, how would 
would we not just be weakening ourselves against the, the powers of uh, adversarial forces who are using it? This is an ugly set of choices. What you need is something that we don't have, which is someone who could say, right, we need the ability to recognize that you're a human, to recognize that you're a, u a unique and specific individual human too, and yet at the same time provide you with anonymity and privacy. Those are three things. That is the, uh, the golden ring, if, if we can call it that. And the issue, of course, is always the last one because the intelligence services are diametrically opposed to the idea of the third, of anonymity, that you should have a right to privacy, right. a right to sanctuary. This is the tension we're living in. Right, and, and this is why the Patriot Act uh, was a bad idea. It was a terrible idea. And we had many liberals like Naomi Wolf screaming about it uh, at the time I naively uh, thought, no, George Bush wouldn't uh, be for anything that's bad. That's how stupid I am. I confess it freely. Um, we had conservatives like John Smirak screaming about the Patriot Act and, and the neocons and what they were doing. And it all happened. Uh, and people knew that, well, when the other side gets in power, they can use these things against you. That is what's happening now. So it, it seems to me that... Uh, Part of the, the, the larger picture is that we need people in Congress and in the Senate and in the White House who understand these things and who have the political will to do something about them. That's the challenge. What's interesting to me listening to you speak, it reminds me that you know, it was, let's call them the old school liberals, the, yeah. the 1960s liberals, who were the first to identify the rise of and danger of the secret government within the U.S. The fact that, hold on, all of a sudden there was this fourth branch operating in government that, by the way, scared presidents. Eisenhower, Kennedy, rightly, others were deathly afraid of the power of the CIA, the power of the deep state, and what it, what it could do. Conservatives, for whatever reason, continued to have faith in, the, in their government, how it was operating, that all of these forces were somehow working for good in the Cold War and, and, and after. And unfortunately, to your point, it's only been lately that conservatives have begun to realize that those old school liberals were prophetic in their voice of saying, this secret government is dangerous and it is working against the interests of we the people. Well, and again, this is why we need civics. I'm trying to get Richard Dreyfus on the program to talk about civics. If you don't understand how America works, I, I wrote about this in, in my book, uh, If You Can Keep It. I didn't really understand this until a few years ago. I really began to process that most of my life I haven't really understood how America works, how liberty functions, you know, to really appreciate the, the rarity uh, of what we have in America and understand the vigilance it takes to preserve it. For decades, uh, many people kind of let that slide. And so you end up in a place where people that we haven't elected are, are in power. And again, we, we saw this, you mentioned it, but I mean, Eisenhower and Kennedy were awake to this. I mean, I think the CIA murdered Kennedy because he was ruffling these feathers. That's how sick it is, and that is 60 years ago. Yes, and they did it because they had become accustomed to being able to do it in foreign countries. In right. other words, the long list of CIA interference in countries around the world during the heights of the Cold War in the 50s and 60s, it exten extends beyond 50 different countries, including coups and political assassinations. By the time 1963 came around, they were well practiced in these dark arts. Mike, uh, you and I last night touched on something uh, uh, off the air, something crazy but true. And I thought, let's, let's mention this on the yeah. program. This is the final segment of today, so here's your chance. Well, it just caught my eye a, a week ago because I thought it was so preposterous, I couldn't believe it was true. But it turns out that in Minnesota, at the Minnesota Art Center, there is a taxpayer-funded exhibit which was uh, described as a family-friendly demon summoning, summoning, excuse me, family-friendly demon summoning, where uh, children and families were invited to pick a demon that they could uh, invoke and, you know, attract a trap, trap to them. This is something that, you know, <laughs> crazy Christians would make up. It couldn't possibly be true, except it's true. So I look into it. And Minnesota. In Minnesota. Taxpayer-funded money, okay, in a public, uh, public space. And it turns out that the exhibit that they were displaying was, called, was with a particular demon called Lilith the Empathic Demon. 
And I started, I looked at this and I, something struck me about the name Lilith. And so I, I dusted off some, some, some old reading and, and I remembered that this Lilith, okay, was in the Babylonian uh, pantheon of gods, uh, was a she-demon, a very powerful one and very feared. Lilith was a succubus. Lilith was a demon whose tricks of the trade were to cause uh, miscarriages, stillbirths, uh, infant I, I mean, deaths. it's like if, if, there was a, if there was a demonic power behind abortion, for example, this is what we're talking about. This is the, and th these are actual demonic powers. We don't need to get into it. But you're telling me that in Minnesota, they are making this seem friendly. Folks, what could be more wicked? What could be sicker than this, that, that in the United States of America, you have people who are basically apologists for the demonic, literally. And they called this demon Lilith the empath empathic demon, like empathic, your friend from the pit of hell. And yet there's more. So not only was this demon associated with infant death, uh, it also was associated with stealing of young children, with seducing men in order to use their seed to produce uh, demon offspring. And again, to your point at a moment in the culture, how this is so true of, of all of these things. Now, it struck me that that was all very, very coincidental and probably meant something more than what it intended. And then imagine my shock a few days later when I'm watching uh, a review of the movie Barbie. And one of the things, and I know that for a lot of women, Barbie speaks to empowerment, it speaks to uh, some aspirational, someone to look up to, et cetera. That's what Mattel wants you to think, That's by right. the way. They paid for the movie, no joke. And but there's something very odd that goes on in the beginning of this movie, which is this sort of replication of the first opening scene of 2001, A Space Odyssey, except here in Barbie, the young girls are pushing, instead of, uh, instead of monkeys, you know, learning enlightenment from this ob obelisk that comes down, uh, there are these young girls pushing around prams with dolls, baby dolls that they're nurturing and taking care of, and they're made to look very sad about doing so. A giant Barbie emerges as if from the sky, this monolithic uh, idol. And soon enough, these, these young girls are taking their babies and smashing their skulls against rocks and against this each other. This is in the movie Barbie, folks, not recommended. Uh, we've just got seconds left. Uh, let's wrap this up and we can catch it uh, So tomorrow. just a, a quick wrap point is it turns out the origins of Barbies, who looked this up, was from a German woman who found uh, an, a model in a German sex doll who went by the name of Lil. Now, in German, Lil uh, can mean a bunch of different things, including related to light and otherwise. But I, again, found this coincidence with Lil and Lilith from the origins of Barbie to be too deep and too strange. Well, uh, when you're smashing baby skulls in a movie uh, paid for by Mattel to sell Barbie dolls, it's, it's just so creepy.